It's a great pleasure to welcome so many people. I, I was concerned when, when Albert uh, started this title with the Icelandic. I wanted the Icelandic to be the subtitle, but somehow, Matt, you got through the title to the subtitle, I presume, unless you read Icelandic, because <laughs> otherwise it, it seemed like it might daunt you. But you're undaunted, which is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> You may think that this is a kind of an unusual thing for Alaric to be talking about, but in fact, his PhD was on the meanings of elf and elves in medieval England. And the book that he has published, um, 2007, Elves in Anglo-Saxon England, Matters of Belief, Health, Gender, and Identity. I mean, lots of interesting angles there for people to take up, I think. Anyway, if you were here on Friday, you'll know that Alaric is an excellent lecturer, so you're in for a treat, I'm sure. Thanks very much, John. Um, you okay there, Trish? Yeah. Um, yeah, it has to. I mean, I've put the cover of the book up here. You know, just since I've published it, I might as well show it. It's a book about a very interesting topic. The book itself is very boring, however. <laughs> so, so, so don't don't rush to buy it. Um, th and the picture, um, it's not actually of, of elves. Uh, the publisher was like, "We need a picture on the front," and I was like, "Great, but no pictures of elves." Um, and they were like, we don't care, find one. Um, so it's a bit of 10th century uh, Anglo-Scandinavian sculpture there. Um, yeah, and um, what I did with my PhD was to be mainly looking at early medieval England. Um, but many of you will be aware that early medieval England is intimately connected with Scandinavia at the same time for two reasons. One reason is that English and the Scandinavian languages were in about 500 AD the same language. Okay, so they both come from the same language, um, the same kind of cultural origin point. So a lot of comparisons between English and Scandinavian culture in the early Middle Ages. And then, of course, there's a lot of toing and froing between the British Isles and Scandinavia because of the Vikings. So although I was researching mainly kind of English stuff for this, uh, for this book that I wrote, um, I brought in a lot of Scandinavian material by way of comparison. Um, and it's been really fun for me for this lecture to kind of rethink that and go and look at different stuff and to start thinking about elves in an Icelandic context specifically rather than an English one. Uh, a friend of mine at uh, the University of Iceland commented that it would be a patient man who attempted to write a history of elves in Iceland. There's a lot of material to work with and I'm by no means going to be comprehensive in, in this talk. Um, I'll more or less go chronologically. We won't get kind of everything that was ever said about elves. We'll get a few kind of highlights. But I, I want to start with, um, you know, something appropriate to a kind of quiet Sunday afternoon lecture where, where you, you know, you just want to have a nice weekend rest. I want to talk about the nature of reality. Um, it always seems an appropriate departing point for any kind of intellectual endeavour. If I was a philosopher, right, I'd be really sophisticated about this. The nature of reality is a phenomenally complex business. But I've got to get at least some of the kind of ideas sort of up front before, well, before we kind of get to the end of the lecture and someone says, but are elves really real? Do you believe in elves? Um, we'll deal with the term superstition first. This is, this is partly, uh, well, it's something I, I, I do often, but I was interviewed uh, a few months ago by a, a British TV presenter for a, for a TV series called, uh, the guy's called Tony Robinson. And this TV series is called Tony Robinson's Superstitions. And, oh, dear, you know, and I just spend so much time trying to convince people to get past this word, and there I am, kind of get sort of on TV with this kind of above my head. Um, and the word superstition comes into use more or less in the Reformation, right, as a term of abuse. Um, different sort of people with different varieties of Christianity sling this at people with other varieties of Christianity to tell them that their variety of Christianity is wrong. Um, and it's a term that implies something that's left over from the past. Literally, it's something that stands across um, or sort of steps across. Um, and uh, that gives us the idea that elves or other beliefs that we often label superstitions are kind of fossils. They're just kind of fixed things that have survived from the past but with no real relevance to the present that people are somehow thoughtlessly, accidentally handing on. And it seems very unlikely that culture works that way. People talk about stuff, people hand on ideas because they're relevant and because they're meaningful. It's a very complex process. Um, but I find it much more helpful to think about belief than superstition. So, um, so not talking about superstitions. People quite often say, 
And people believed in elves because they didn't really understand how the world worked in the Middle Ages. And I'm like, no, no. Elves are a way of understanding the world, just as we have ways of understanding the world now. Um, and that kind of brings us on to, to reality as well. Um, there is an index entry in, in the Elves book uh, that is just reality, page 14. Um, I quite enjoyed that, putting that entry in. Um, and I, I just want to kind of discuss a couple of kinds of reality that are sort of relevant. There's physical objective reality. And if you're a philosopher, even that's pretty complex. But most people are okay with, you know, the table is there, there are atoms there, um, there is matter and energy there. That's objective reality. But there are other kinds of reality too. Um, and a kind of example that I give because it's very prominent in the modern world and helps us to understand how important other kinds of reality can be is money. I don't mean cash. I don't mean notes and coins. I mean money. I mean, if I've got a kind of $20 note, is that really worth $20? There's no inherent physical reality about that money that makes it worth $20 yet I can exchange it for $20 worth of goods and services if I'm in a country that recognises that currency. That currency is really worth $20 if everyone believes that it's worth $20. So um, social groups and cultures can create realities. Um, I can't just wish away the value of $20. I can't just sort of declare it to be a fiction. But at the same time, it's not an objective reality. So elves can kind of function in that kind of way. They're real because people believe they're real and it has a real, they have a real effect on life and culture. I'm going to try another example along these lines that's a little bit less abstract than money. It's, I mean, potentially a bit of a... Oh, it's an example that can get people hot, hot under the collar for understandable reasons, um, but I'll try it anyway. Um, that's the idea of the prowling rapist. Um, those of you who work in feminism might be much more clued up about this than me. But um, certainly in Northwest Europe, um, and I imagine in North America too, there's this cultural idea of the prowling rapist, a kind of guy probably with a leather jacket, maybe some kind of balaclava, who lurks in parks after dark to kind of seize unwary women. And these figures are presented in popular culture, movies, uh, TV series, um, prominent in the media. And every now and then, a real prowling rapist does come into existence. It can happen, right? But the vast majority of all rapes are committed by people who are already acquaintances of the victim. And so we have this narrative of the prowling rapist. That's what comes to people's mind when you talk about rape and rapists. But it doesn't map very neatly onto reality. It's a monster. It's, um, it's something that controls where women go, when they go. It genders space. It affects behaviour. Um, it affects people's senses of risk. Um, but isn't really real, or if it is real, it's based on a kind of tiny little aspect of our objective reality, and obscures all sorts of actual realities about how rape really works in our society. So elves can function a bit like this, right? They, they can be real, um, even if there's no objective reality to them. They can be culturally very important. And then there's a sort of slightly weirder level again of reality, um, which I've never quite got my head around. I'm still working on it, essentially. Um, it's when you kind of believe and do not believe at the same time, which is not quite the same. I, you know, I sort of believe in the value of money. Um, that's a kind of actually believing in it, because it really does work. Um, but uh, my example for this is my dad. Um, poor chap. Um, one day I'm sitting there at my computer, right, and he sends around this email, and he sent it to all his address book. Okay? He, he thought it was worth sending it to everyone he knew. And it was this email that said, if you put an egg between two mobile phones for an hour the egg will come away cooked. Think what's happening to your brain. <laughs> My dad is a trained aircraft engineer. Okay? He, he knows how much energy is in a battery in a mobile phone. If he thought about it for a moment, he would know that you couldn't possibly boil an egg with the whole of the energy in those mobile phones, let alone the vague microwaves they may be kind of sending out. Yet, he sees fit to send that to me and all his friends, not in a jokey way, a kind of serious way. People very often do this. It, so he, he, he can't have believed that, because otherwise he'd have stopped using his phone instantly. <laughs> um, but at the same time, he believed it enough to pass it on. So you get this very weird kind of situation where people can believe and not believe, that it's a real meaningful part of your culture, um, while at the same time 
you don't fundamentally subscribe to it. And sometimes elves fall into that category. Cool. So I just wanted to get that set up. Um, and elves are really kind of prominent in Icelandic culture now. And many of you will be aware of stories of roads being redirected to go around elf dwellings <laughs> and uh, sort of figures like 80% of Icelanders believe in elves. I haven't deigned to put up a slide about this stuff. I mean, the Icelanders I know, none of them really kind of seem to believe in elves in that kind of way. And there must be some out there, right? But, um, but, but that, that kind of uh, sort of... S- Clear social reality isn't apparent to me when I go to Iceland and talk to Icelanders. But it's not just laid on for the tourists, and this was a big surprise to me. It's, it's not just the source of tourist revenue. Um, when you start looking around Icelandic popular culture, culture that Icelanders are making for Icelanders, elves are all over the shop. Um, here's an album by Sia Rolf. Some of you will know the band. Um, others of you won't. Um, it's got a, a song called Star Alvar uh, on the album. It means stare elf. It's in Icelandic, right? They're not particularly expecting the world to be listening to this. So they're talking to other Icelanders. They're not just selling this as tourist fodder. Um, It's a kind of slightly sci-fi, psychedelic, sort of wistful number. Um, Many of you will know the work of Björk Rydmanstoltir, otherwise known as Björk. Um, Here's an album that she did with a kind of jazz trio, again, for an Icelandic audience primarily. And on this album is the song of the Litli Tónlistar Maðurinn, which is a story about some elves who kind of play in an orchestra. It's very kind of whimsical, but it's there. Icelanders are kind of talking about this stuff, and you can kind of go on. This is a really nasty, postmodern, misogynistic novel set in kind of urban Reykjavik in the 90s. It's all about club culture, drinking, drugs, computers. Um, But elves still get mentioned, not as actually kind of characters who walk through the story, but they're a point of reference for the characters. Um, Again, intended originally for an Icelandic audience. Uh, it's a film that uh, I could only find the English um, cover, um, um Brilliant film, feminist film. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, you've got this uh, character who, during the Second World War, has been hanging out in America. She returns to Iceland because of some slightly mysterious breakup with her husband. Um, and amongst other things, um, I mean, she's partly bringing modernity to Iceland. It's partly a film about coming to America, or going to America, and coming back with all this modern stuff to a kind of third world rock in the Atlantic. Um, But at the same time, she kind of encounters elves, or something that vaguely seems to be elves, and she goes a bit mad. They're part of the story, they're part of this narrative about modernity in Iceland. So I just wanted to kind of get this stuff up and running, So, and I'll come back to this at the end. It's a 2010 film, Sumerlandid, about a guy depicted who gets just too good an offer for the elf stone in his garden from a German tourist, sells it for 50,000 euros to pay his debts, and then everything goes wrong. <laughs> it, it's kind of a comedy. It's quite a bad film. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's not intended for us, right? This is Icelanders talking to each other, and somehow elves are a good denomination of cultural discourse, even now, even though people don't kind of buy into elves in any straightforward sense. So what I'm going to do from here is go right back kind of 1,500-odd years and take the elf story in Iceland forward from before the settlement of Iceland itself, um, kind of up to the present day, sort of just picking out uh, different bits and pieces. Um, I'm going to start in Anglo-Saxon England, and this is because Anglo-Saxons get writing before Scandinavians. Basically, they convert to Christianity sooner. Christianity is one of the main ways that people get technology of literacy in Northwest Europe in the Middle Ages. So uh, Anglo-Saxons get writing, um, and that gives us more or less earlier evidence than Scandinavians offer. And elves turn up most often in Anglo-Saxon texts, in medical texts. Um, They cause illness. Um, And... Scholars have kind of looked at this stuff. They just get mentioned in passing, right? No one has a long description of what an elf looks like or how, how it might cause the illness. It's just like, okay, we should do this if your cow's suffering from this. And if elves did it, then you should probably add in some psalms. Here you go. Um, but but these, these texts are really matter of fact. In fact, they're not just matter of fact. They're really high status. So you can see here, I mean, you don't have to be able to read it. Um, it's a beautiful manuscript. It's not like a flashy manuscript that we're looking at here. Um, British Library, Royal 12D17, for what it's worth. 10th century manuscript from Wessex. Um, it's not flashy, but it's really nice. Okay, big margins, carefully laid out. 
A lot of the material inside is it's in Old English, but it's translated from Latin. It's cutting-edge scientific material that's coming straight up from the Mediterranean. Um, it's associated with the court of King Alfred and other West Saxon kings. So it's high status, scholarly, and it's got elves in, in a totally matter-of-fact sort of way, which gives me the idea that for Anglo-Saxons, elves are like money, that level of social reality. Um, they tend to be kind of marginal to the text. So they tend to kind of come at the end... Um, in, they're not kind of in centre position, but they're there, uh, and, and a reasonable number of references as well. And people have previously looked at this for a kind of good century and a half. They've kind of imagined that the sort of elves that we might be dealing with are kind of just little demonic sprites. There's no real reason, no real evidence for that, but that was just, I suppose, the 19th century conception of what an elf might be, and it just got buried in, or sort of built into scholarship, and no one really questioned it. So people imagine that Anglo-Saxons have these little winged sprites going around, kind of causing trouble. Um, And then when you actually look at the evidence, you start to find something that's much more like what we're going to see in Iceland um, a little bit later. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of this. Um, In the unlikely event that you're interested, you can read the book. Um, (laughs) Tedious though it is. Um, The word for elves in Old English is an ethnonym. That is to say, a word for a group of people, a tribe or a a nation. Uh, It it functions grammatically in the same way as Egypta, Egyptians, um, uh, Mircha, Mercians, people from the kind of central bit of Anglo-Saxon England. Um, It's a word for a group of people. Elves are people. And this is going to keep going right through the lecture. Elves are people. People in our culture really struggle with that idea. I think perhaps because we're working in a kind of post-Linnaeus sort of world, we think in terms of species, and people are like, OK, I'm a human, but an elf can't be a human because um, it's not real, um, or because it's got magic powers. Humans don't have magic powers. We're dealing with a world where you might have a witch living next door, right? I mean, John might, might be a witch. He might actually have magic powers. He might hang out with the devil in the 16th century. Um, the idea that elves can be supernatural and human is not a problem for, for these societies. So elves are people, and it looks like they've been people since maybe the 7th century when this kind of linguistic evidence just about creeps onto our, onto our horizons. Um, they're kind of cool. Yeah, you can name your children after elves. Alfred, elf advice is, is what it actually means. Um, I don't know how much Anglo-Saxons think about that, but they're aware that it means elf advice. I mean, they talk enough about personal names and their meanings that you can see that, you know, they give some thought to this stuff. And elves are associated with these pagan gods that in Old English are called Erza, in Old Icelandic, Aesir. Um, these uh, gods also come up in personal names. Oswald um, has this Ors word, which kind of means pagan god. Um, elves get associated with hills and valleys in place names. Um, And in all these respects, they're distinct from loads of other words that we have in Old English that we might say are for monsters. Um, There are loads of words for kind of bad, nasty, supernatural beings that you don't include in personal names that occur in different kinds of place names associated with different kinds of places um, that are not grammatically words for a group of people. So elves do seem to be a distinctive kind of cultural group. And this this is something that I'm going to problematise but also kind of carry through right through the Icelandic story. Um, Yeah, and you also get this layer of culture where people are like, (coughs) elves are demons. And then you get other layers of Anglo-Saxon cultures where they're they're really not so sure about that. Uh, Elves aren't necessarily demons. There's a sort of duality. Different people in Anglo-Saxon England have slightly different ideas. Um, I'm going to glance at Ireland as well. Ireland is kind of famed for its texts about the Aishiva, the people of the the mounds. Um, People very often think about fairies as a distinctively Celtic cultural phenomenon. Um, And it's certainly the case that some of these early Irish texts give us paradigms that are very useful for understanding Scandinavian belief. Um, This is a text about a guy called Cahullan. Many of you will have heard of him, a great kind of northern hero um, in Ireland. Um, And one day, I'm not reading out the slide at this stage, one day some swans fly by and they've got these gold chains on their necks. And Cahullan's like, oh, wow, I'm going to kill them. Everyone's like, oh, swans with gold chains around their necks are usually something a bit special. Anyway, he has a go, and he fails. Um, He's like, oh, that was rubbish. He's only 16 at the time, poor lad. Um, And then, somewhat mysteriously, Cahullan went and put his back against a pillar stone, and he was downcast, and a sleep fell upon him. Hello, are you here for elves? 
I am. Good. It's just there's a potential clash with some other people, so I thought I'd check. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Cullen was downcast and asleep fell upon him. He saw two women come towards him. One wore a green mantle and the other a purple mantle in five folds. Don't ask me why it's got five folds. There it is. Um, the woman in the green mantle came to him and laughed at him and struck him with her horsewhip. The other came to him too and laughed at him and struck him in the same way. And they continued for a long time, each of them in turn coming still to beat him until he was almost dead. Then they went from him. The Ulaith, um, his people, um, observed that, that and they said that he should be wakened. No, said Fergus, do not disturb him. It is a vision that he sees. Here we've got human-like supernatural beings turning up causing what we might call illness, in this instance by beating someone up. Um, the idea of supernatural beings riding their victim and causing illness is there in Anglo-Saxon England. So these horsewhips might be kind of relevant. Um, and the ultimate objective for these women, believe it or not, is actually to woo Cahullan, um for the queen of the Aishiva. Um, and basically he's not going to get better until he goes and sleeps with her. So this is about seduction, it's about illness, it's about a human-like population who live next door, in this case the Ice Sheila. Um, and weirdly, when Cahillan wakes up from, from this kind of vision, he spouts a load of wisdom poetry. It's a bit unexplained in the text, but there are parallels in Anglo-Saxon England as well for hanging out with elves being associated with gaining prophetic power um, and, and, and wisdom. So I think we can imagine a very similar situation to Anglo -Saxon, in Anglo-Saxon England to this kind of culture that Narratives like this that we don't have as such in England were nonetheless doing the rounds. It fits the linguistic and medical evidence that we have from England. Um, cool. And I don't really think this is to do with borrowing from Celtic culture. I just think this is what's going on in Northwest European culture generally in the early Middle Ages. Um, let's uh, get into some of the early Scandinavian evidence then, and then we'll kind of move to Iceland specifically. Um, early Scandinavian evidence, like this Anglo-Saxon stuff, is not heavy on narratives. People don't tell us stories about elves in this period. Stories about elves must be doing the rounds, but, but that's not what our texts want to give us. So we just get these little hints around the edge. It's one reason why my book is so boring. It's basically a kind of linguistics book, um, where I have to kind of do all this kind of philology to kind of get at what, what the words might be implying. Um, here's a bit of scaldic verse. Some of you will have encountered this peculiarly complex genre of praise poetry from early, well, early and later medieval Scandinavia. Um, depending on what your level of school, dealing with scaldic verse is, you can kind of have the Old Norse or a literal translation or a sensible translation down at the bottom. I'll do it in Norse just because I like it, and then, then we'll have the translation. Flöt af sert við sveita sóknar álfs í gólfi Hræfa dök þars höfnar hendur sem fætur af kendu. Fetli blóði blandin brun ölska ki runna þars á leifa landa löfi fátt að höfði. Um, corpses dew streamed over seats with the sweat or blood, as the case may be, of the alver of attack. So this is a poetic way of just saying a warrior. Okay? Alver of attack, a warrior. Um, where hewed hands like feet could be recognised. The ale giver of bushes, bushes are people, it's just a standard metaphor in Old Norse poetry. The ale giver of bushes is a king, a guy who gives ale to people, um, fell headfirst into a river mixed with blood. That is depicted on the leaf of Levi's lands. Um, that's a metaphor for a shield, and this seems to be a story that's being depicted on a shield about a gentleman called Jörmen Reker, um, a, uh, a king who kind of came to a sticky end. Um, so this is the kind of glimpse that we get of what people are thinking about elves this early on in Scandinavia. We can say that it's a good metaphor for a warrior. And just as Anglo-Saxons will name people after elves, but they won't name them after ogres and trolls, Scandinavian poets will use names for elves or the word elf in metaphors for humans, but they won't use words for monsters in metaphors for humans. So we can glimpse that the idea of elves that's doing the rounds in this culture is perhaps quite similar to what we're seeing in England. They're fundamentally like people. Um, gods of other kinds turn up in this position. The aus of attack, um, that would be another, or the gwoth of attack, the god of attack. Those would be legitimate ways of talking about a warrior. So it seems that elves kind of come in a package of that kind. I won't unpack the rest of that slide. Um, I'll instead go on to 
Idaic verse, another genre of early medieval Scandinavian verse, much harder to date. Um, and here, elves almost only turn up in this formulaic association with Aesir, um, up, up there in the first line, the pagan gods. Um, and here's a line from the lecture title, of course. Kvaðer með ásum, kvaðer með alvum. What's with the Aesir, or what's going on with the Aesir? What's going on with the elves? Uh, these words alliterate, and poets just like to join them together a lot. And all we can really say from this is that elves and these pagan gods seem to be kind of similar. Um, pagan gods in medieval Scandinavia, at least in our evidence, are also people. Um, if you want to meet one, you have to go and walk to where he lives. They don't float around up in heaven. It's what we get in most of our texts. Um, some people have, well, most people in fact, have argued that this is euhemorization, the process of uh, Christians taking pagan gods who ought to be floating up in the heavens and just turning them into people. Um, I suspect that actually it was always like that, um, that gods are just people. They're just like supernaturally powerful people. They're a bit like superheroes. Um, but they're not like the Christian god. It's a really different kind of theology. Um, so, so this is what we get early on. And what I'd like to do now is to move into later Icelandic evidence um, and, and, and sort of unpack both a bit more detail about these elves, but also a bit about how they might be changing in changing Scandinavian culture. I should have explained first, this is a map of how I think categories of beings are working in medieval Scandinavian culture. Um, I won't unpack it at, at great length, but I've drawn this distinction between people and monsters. There are a few kinds of beings that can wind up being both, depending on the situation and the text. These might be outlaws, they might be people who've died but are still walking around. Um, but it looks to me like gods are kind of on the human side. Um, and they're sort of in opposition to these monsters. Um, I think that's the fundamental system that, that we're seeing coming through in these um, early Scandinavian texts. And indeed in the Anglo-Saxon evidence, such as it is. Cool. Iceland, then. So, you know, most of that evidence was before Iceland was even settled, let alone when they actually start writing. Um, but now we actually get into the period where Iceland has been settled around 874. Um, they've converted to Christianity around 1,000. And now they're starting to write texts because they've got this liter literacy stuff through the Christian church. Um, many of you will have heard of Snorra Edda, Snorri's Edda, which is a kind of handbook of Old Norse mythology. Um, in my research, I've wound up kind of sidelining that as evidence for what most people thought, at least prior to Snorri writing it. He's very influential later. Um, he kind of, in many ways, tries to take Christian mythology and paganise it to kind of give traditional sounding names to concepts from Christian theology, mythology, as you prefer. Um, so Christianity kind of has angels and demons. Well, say, medieval Christianity does anyway. Um, and Snodbury kind of takes that idea and he kind of sticks traditional sounding labels on those ideas. Ljósalvar, light elves for the angels. Dökkalvar, dark elves for, for the demons. So I don't think he's telling us very much about what normal people thought about elves, but it's very interesting as a kind of cultural response um, between kind of Christianity and traditional culture in medieval Scandinavia. What I'm going to really be talking about is this 14th century stuff, um, these romances that we get from about 1300 onwards, which come in prose. They also come in the form of rimur, which are these long, rhyming um, narrative poems, and also in the form of ballads. Um, and the 14th century, as people were here, some people were hearing um, from me on Friday, is this kind of weirdly neglected time in medieval Scandinavia, um, or at least in Iceland. Um, the sort of standard Icelandic narrative is that Norway takes control of Iceland around 1262 to 1264, and after that, it just all goes wrong. The literature's bad, life is bad, uh, there are volcanoes going off, um, just everything becomes bad after Norway takes over. Um, and it's kind of quite fashionable now, and I'm part of this trend, to sort of start looking at the 14th century on its own terms and seeing it as a really interesting, dynamic time in Icelandic literature and culture. So when most of our manuscripts of these vaunted sagas actually start to appear, uh, most of these kind of 13th century sagas that are sort of standard fare and undergraduate syllabuses are attested in the 14th century. And people are writing loads of new stuff. They're getting into European romance. They're getting into Latin literature in new ways. So it's actually a really dynamic, interesting time. Um, traditionally, we've looked at kind of texts from the 14th century that are influenced 
by European material. And we've gone, well, that's not proper Scandinavian. I did this when I did my PhD. I'm just as guilty as anyone else. I'm like, well, you know, it's influenced by French romance. doesn't really tell us about Scandinavian culture. I'll, I'll just leave it to one side. Um, but I've actually come round to the idea that we're not going to understand medieval Iceland unless we understand its engagement with international culture, um, how it's kind of adapting to and adapting uh, mainstream European ideas. Um, so I've come to think of this as a really interesting time. Um, and so I'm going to be talking mainly about that. By the end, we'll come on to this kind of uh, popular culture stuff. Um, yeah, and actually, the comments I was making about Icelandic popular culture very briefly, these albums and films and, and that kind of thing, do emphasise that we've kind of, we scholars, as it were, you, you may consider yourselves among these people, or you may prefer not to, I don't know, but we as scholars have um, tended to kind of say that literary texts um, are a barrier to getting at real belief. Um, a sort of literary poem might kind of reflect real belief, um, but, but is a kind of literary fragmentation or refraction of that, and we need to kind of get through it. And I've increasingly been realising that actually uh, texts, they might be medieval poems, they might be movies now, they're actually what culture's made of. Um, they're not just a, a reflection of our culture. They actually create our culture. Um, so, yeah, um, dealing with literary texts can be a really dynamic and important way of understanding how cultures are working. Um, they're, not, they're not just a kind of echo of culture. They're actually part of culture. Right, let's have a look at some of these. I'm going to draw out two... Oh, oh I, good, I'm glad I put that in, because otherwise I'd have forgotten. My poor friend Hoke. Um, Hoke Thorgerson, he's a friend of mine in Iceland. He's doing his PhD at the University of Iceland. Um, about 14th century linguistics, mainly, uh, or late medieval Icelandic linguistics. Um, but he spends loads of time looking at these old poems, right, that no one's looking at. And so I just get, he, he sends me loads of interesting stuff that I just wouldn't have known about at all had Hoke not kind of put it my way. So I'm quite indebted to him uh, throughout this lecture, really. Um, he, you know, he sends me transcriptions and kind of points to look at. It's just, it's just great. Everyone needs a tame Icelander. Um, <laughs> so, so here's one of these romance sagas, okay, um, we're in a part of a story where um, the bride and the groom are about to get married, but then the evil king of Serkland, which might be North Africa, somewhere in North Africa, Saracen land, um, it's a bit, bit unclear, the evil king of Serkland sends a kind of crack team of uh, magically empowered people dressed as monks to abduct the bride on the wedding night. She disappears. Um, Yatman, uh, the best friend of the groom, um, gets sent off to find her under the uh, pseudonym of Oistvestan, which appears on the second line there. East-West, that's what he calls himself, while he's un undercover, um, searching for this missing bride. And this is a kind of wacky story that you get in these romances, right, that no one puts on the syllabus at all. Um, but they're great. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah, so, uh, so Yatman goes under his pseudonym, Oistvestan, to uh, Serkland, and he inveigles his way into the court, he makes friends with the king, but he needs to find out where the bride is hidden. Um, they're about to find her. It turns out that the uh, mother of this uh, king guy in Serkland is in fact a troll, um, and Yatman is pretending that he really wants to marry her. Um, and so the king's like, well, okay, well, in that case, we'll go and meet my mum. And off they go into the wilderness, um, and the king had a golden pipe, and he blew it loudly. Then Ostvestan saw that hillocks and hills, hummocks and rocks opened up and out came Alvar, these elves, and Notnir, not quite sure how best to translate it, might be witches. It's hard, the meanings of these words are changing a lot during this period. Dvergar, we would say dwarves, however appropriate that might be, and Huldumen, hidden people. Um, some of you will have heard of the Huldufolk as a, as a synonym for Alvar, for elves, the hidden people. Um, they came out too. Um, it's the first attestation of Huldeman, uh, Huldemad, in fact. Um, the king took a purse full of gold and threw it out into the plain, and those who were outside accepted it and divided it up to share it among themselves. The king blows once more into his pipe. And then the cliffs, glaciers, and mountain tops opened up, and out came Thussar, more monsters, and Reesar, giants, and Bergboar, uh, rock dwellers, and all kinds of Ophiolvir, just unbeings or unpeople dodgy kind of evil beings, um, and rushed out onto the plain. Then the king took another person, the king threw it out to them, and they received it and divided it up. 
Some trolls come out later, and eventually out comes the bride, trapped in a golden ball. Um, no, it's a, sil- it's, a, it's, a, it's a glass ball. Sorry, it's not golden at all. It just alliterates with glass. She's trapped in a glass ball. Um, what I want to do with this in terms of elves, two things, really. One is that in this 14th century world, um, we, we have a, a kind of big thrust for associating elves with just any old monsters. This is quite different from what I think we're seeing in our earlier evidence. They're just kind of getting lumped together with all sorts of traditional nasty, bad beings. Um, kind of as a process of demonisation, I suppose. I talked a bit on Friday about how, for the 14th century, we can actually start to glimpse who's writing these sagas. Um, and although we never know, or almost never know, in any individual case, we can often be fairly sure that it's a little bunch of clerics who, although they're working for the church, they, they behave much more like undergraduates. Um, <laughs> That they're kind of these sort of scholarly, kind of slightly jokey, nerdy types. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're clerics, but they, they all have concubines and, and kids. And um, that, yeah, it's, it's a lot like hanging out in a university, I suspect, this little kind of clique in 14th century Iceland. And there, there's probably some quite wacky individuals uh, among them, and they enjoy these kind of crazy stories. But at the same time, they are integrating some of these ideas into a clerical, scholarly Christian worldview. Elves get lumped together with all the other monsters, which are implicitly kind of demons. Something else I love about this, though, is that although people often think, oh, this is kind of foreign, this isn't properly Icelandic, um, it's you know, set in North Africa, what's that got to do with Iceland? There are glaciers. Um, I, I, I've never seen a glacier in North Africa. Um, you can see this kind of world of romance actually being really deeply integrated into the Icelandic landscape that, that the authors know um, and, and, and kind of think about. So, yeah, you know, you get these bergboa coming out of glaciers in, in Serkland. So we're getting this kind of demonization theme. Um, this goes through into uh, Jakmant Rimur, a poetic version of the same text. I've thrown that in because it's our first attestation of this word, Huldufolk, there at the end of the first stanza. And that's still used in modern Icelandic today, Huldefolk, uh, the hidden people. Uh, you get it in kind of continental Scandinavian languages in forms like Huldar, um, means the same thing. Um, so, yeah, th- that's our kind of first moment where that becomes a sort of recognisable word, 14th, 15th, probably 15th, 16th century in that case. Um, and here's a curse from the 14th century. We've got a woman whose uh, foster son isn't getting his own way with the king. So she goes up to the king in the middle of the night and utters this curse at him, Buslubain, Busla's bidding. And amongst other things, she says, may trolls and elves and mountain Notnir, sorry, magic Notnir, um, dwellers, mountain giants, burn your halls. May Frostersar despise you. May horses bugger you. Um, there's going to be more of that later. Um, <laughs> Straws may straws sting you, gales drive you mad, and woe befall you unless you do my will. I'm interested here not only that elves are being associated with uh, monsters, but that here and in the Ataman saga they're very closely integrated with the environment. Glaciers, hills, mountains, the weather. Um, these seem to be coming together for people in this period. And maybe it's the case that in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, um, elves are one of the ways to think about the environment the challenges that it pre- presents to you, the dangers that it presents to you. Elves are, are a way for, uh, sort of a metaphor for that. That use of kind of supernatural beings as a metaphor for the environment is really prominent in, um, say, Icelandic folk tales from the 19th century. But there it's not elves. It's trolls um, and kind of things that we might call ogres. So early on, we get elves looking kind of separate from monsters, And then there's this bit around the 14th century where they look quite closely associated with monsters. And then later on we get material where they seem to be quite separate from monsters again. And I suspect that the separation from monsters is continuous, but it isn't visible in our evidence at at all periods. And the 14th century is a time when a different kind of discourse comes through in our texts, and these clerics are starting to link up trolls and elves and that kind of thing. Um, But this is one of the perhaps cultural functions of elves for these people, to think about the environment think about space and the weather. Um, this goes into prayers as well, the kind of inversion of, of what we're seeing in the curses. Or maybe the curses are actually prayers that these authors have kind of turned inside out to make them into curses. Uh, this is perhaps 16th century, a little bit later. It's probably quite heavily influenced by German material. The work hasn't been done on this, but this is my suspicion. Um, as people again heard on Friday, massive 
German cultural influence on Scandinavia in the late medieval period and the early modern period. Um, so we're here to protect me today, creator, from cruel trolls, crevasses and landslides, from elven kind and clever spirits that serve up the horrible at-scot, whatever that is. An at-shot would be a kind of literal render rendering in English. Some kind of infliction of pain. I suspect it's a low German loan word because it's well paralleled in low German but poorly paralleled in Scandinavia. Um, also to protect you from harm birds, whatever they are, and all mist, darkness and fog, I beg this of you. So again, we're seeing in a different context that kind of association of elves and harm, but also elves in the natural world, elves and demons. So that's one layer of the discourse that's going on uh, as, as ideas about elves are kind of changing in medieval Scandinavia. Here's the other layer that I want to get at for, for this kind of late medieval period. Elves, sex and gender. People are using elves to think and talk about what, what's appropriate behaviour in terms of uh, sexual activity. Um, they're using elves to think about what's appropriate behaviour in terms of gendering as well. Um, this is from the 14th century. If, if I don't put a date on it, it's probably the 14th century. Um, maybe the 15th. Uh, this is a rune stave from Bergen in Norway. So this is not actually from Iceland, but it's from that kind of Scandinavian Norse-speaking world. Um, and, yeah, it says, I carve remedy runes, I carve protection runes, once over by Alvar, twice over by trolls, thrice over by Thursa, maybe ogres. I've never found a word that I'm happy with in English for that. I send to you, I see on you, she-wolf's lust and restlessness. May restlessness come over you and a yurton's fury, a giant's fury. Never sit, never sleep. Love me as you love yourself. This, gentlemen, is how to get a girlfriend in 14th century Norway. Um, fantastic. You, amongst other things, invoke the elves. Is this, is this whimsical? Is it a bit of poetry? Is this actually someone trying to get a girl? Is this magic in action in 14th century Norway? We can't be sure. But it's not just a bit of literature that's floating out there in a manuscript. It's doing something quite different. Um, and... Yeah, it's starting to integrate the idea of elves into the idea of getting a girl, sex, um, and gendering. And we can see that a bit in a bit more detail in, in a variety of other texts. I just realise my mouse is there. Good. Um, some of these I've mentioned before. This is, in a way, me kind of summing up this medieval stuff before I do a quick kind of what about modern Iceland uh, spiel at the end. Um, and I just want to kind of pull out a few themes that we can see in a few of these texts uh, that associate elves and gender. So these are Anglo-Saxon medical texts. They're often, well, no, not often. They're occasionally next to texts that are for when the devil tries to have sex with you. That, uh, we've got one for that. Um, or um, supernatural beings trying to ride you, which might have kind of sexual connotations. Um, and interestingly, these medical texts give us the word alfseden, um, Seeden seems to be associated, well, seems to be cognate with an Old Norse word, seither, which is a kind of magic. I don't know if anyone knows Welsh. There's a Welsh word, heed, that means magic. Again, it's etymologically the same word. Um, and in Scandinavia, seither is magic that men didn't ought to do. Um, it's explicitly uh, demeaning for men to do this magic. It's magic for girls. Um, we, we kind of get this coming, sort of explicitly stated in the text. And elves seem to be getting up to this kind of magic. You sort of worry that elves might be a bit girly. Um, <laughs> that there's something not quite right about their gendering as far as Anglo-Saxons are concerned. That, I don't want to sound homophobic, right? And that's not my point at all. But this is a very macho society um, and is very homophobic. Uh, it, though in different ways to how our society does it. Völund is uh, uh, a Norse poem. The ones in bold are Norse texts. Um, does seem to be about an elf, does seem to be a narrative about an elf from Scandinavia, but may be influenced by English material, um, seems quite likely. And fundamental to the story is this guy gets seduced by a supernatural being, and then in a different bit of the story, goes and rapes a girl. Um, and so when we start to get narratives about elves, just as in the Irish material, Sheraglia con um, we see these supernatural beings trying to kind of seduce people and have sex with them. Um, both sexes. Um, same thing's going on in 12th century French poetry, very courtly, very flashy. Marie de France, uh, very sophisticated. Um, yeah, I'll stick with sophisticated. Sophisticated uh, writer, don't like her work, but that's a different story. 
Um, and she kind of tells similar stories. These supernatural human-like or human beings seducing people. And it's setting up the boundaries for kind of proper sexual behaviour. Uh, Njal Saga has a great line that hardly anyone's commented on. Njal Saga is one of the most famous of all uh, Icelandic sagas. Um, and uh, the, the sort of the heroes um, are riding along, and there are a couple of guys who they're going to go and kill. Um, and uh, one of them is wearing really flashy red clothes. And Skarpjevin, this really masculine, brutal guy, says, uh, uh, Do you see the red elf guys? Um, and he's calling this guy who's in the flashy clothes an elf. It sort of sounds like, you know, he's saying that this guy's a bit camp, um, and, and we're going to beat him up. Um, so again, we're getting this idea that elves don't quite work in terms of gendering. Um, Southern English legendary, late 13th century English text, again associates elves with seduction. So we can build up quite a strong body of evidence. Guth Kaus, the old poem that no one's read apart from Hoker and me now. Um, uh, Mid-14th century, set in Greece, but again, very Icelandic composition, basically about an elf who seduces a girl. It kind of has a happy ending. They get to go off together. But it's sort of a happy ending in the same way that the, the end of the first book of Don Quixote is a happy ending. Um, you get the marriage. Um, that there's this girl. She's been really miserable. Everything's gone wrong for her. And it all comes together at the end because she gets to marry the guy who raped her. And everyone's like, yay, fantastic. You know, I mean, that's, that's how you get married, right? Um, and sort of in kind of 17th century, 16th century Spanish culture, that's fine, right? That's okay. The, the man has done the honourable thing and married the girl that he had sex with. But at the same time, it's disconcerting, um, distinctly disconcerting, more so to us than to people then. And I think this, this girl going off with this elf over the horizon in Guttkarsdjol is, again, disconcerting. Um, I'll, uh, I'll leave the kind of final details, but this kind of theme does go on into the um, early modern period. So I'd just like to finish by um, coming back round to the 20th century. Um, I've talked about this kind of mid uh, or late medieval stuff and early modern stuff. Uh, the 17th century sees theological debates over whether elves exist, nicely paralleled in Scotland at the same time. This isn't just an Icelandic thing. Uh, 19th century sees the collection of all these folk tales. Uh, many of them have been translated into English. It's quite easy to get hold of them. Really interesting material. But I'd like to talk just a bit about this kind of popular culture and think about what it means now. Um, I, I could kind of, I, well, I kind of will skip through these just to remind you that they're there. But I sort of want to report a joke that's been doing the rounds in, uh, in Reykjavik. Um, there's a dist I'm, you know, when you explain a joke right, it's always a bit desperate. Um, there's this district of Reykjavik called Kolpavorgur. Um It became the yuppie district during the boom years. Okay, all the cool bankers were moving there. Sigurd the Folter, the character in the novel I'm talking about on Tuesday, buys his house in Kolpavorgur with his banker wife. Um, and, um, and it had this, this huge housing boom, right? And then there was a crash, and now you've got all these really flash penthouses in Kolpavorgur with no one to live in them. Meanwhile, Kolpavorgur is infamously the home of some elves, if you go on a kind of tourist elf tour in Reykjavik, they'll take you around and they'll show you where they live. So the joke that's been doing the rounds is that, yeah, you know, the elves have got kind of fed up with people kind of knocking on their doors all the time and they want some peace and quiet. So they've moved into the penthouses. Um, oh, I've got to laugh. It's not too bad, is it? I mean, it's easier when you don't have to unpack all that stuff first, right? Um, and, and this shows how elves are a way for Icelanders to talk about important stuff. It's a way for Icelanders now to talk about the crash. Um, there are a way for Icelanders to joke about um, tourism in Iceland and the um, objectification and the touristification of Icelandic culture. It's a way for Icelanders to talk about why they're special and also to laugh at tourists. Um, and so although Icelanders don't believe in elves, we can see that they're a really current, meaningful part of Icelandic discussions about what their identity is and what makes them special and how their world works. They're perhaps fundamentally a way for Icelanders at the moment to think not about gender, um, not about the natural world, uh, but about modernity, uh, which has come late to Iceland, right? You know, before the Second World War, Iceland really is a third world country. Um, they only started to catch up with places like Canada five years ago, and then it all went wrong. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, modernity is a really special thing for Icelanders, and elves are, are, are really kind of have become a really important way for Icelanders to reflect on 
what their culture was, how their culture worked, how their culture might work. It's of course not the only way to do it. They're not only writing about elves, but I think that's what elves are doing at the moment in Iceland. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.